morning. You're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, let's take a look at the headlines this morning. Asian markets start Friday on a muted note after Nasdaq falls the most in three weeks. Trump attacks at the EU and Canada on trade ahead of the G7 summit that starts today. Interim Finance Minister Piyush Goel will meet the heads of PSU banks today. On the agenda is the consolidation roadmap of state-owned banks. And India may delay auctions of solar power panel producers as it looks to incorporate feedback from manufacturers after China's cap on new production. Now, it is a mixed close on Wall Street. The Dow ended in the green for the second straight day. However, a sell-off in technology shares saw the Nasdaq fall the most in three weeks. Also, there was a huge downward spike in the yield on the treasuries after concerns of distress in emerging markets, particularly in Brazil. But here's Abigail Doolittle to sum up all of Thursday's Wall Street session. Stock finished mixed in Thursday's Wall Street session with the Dow climbing by four tenths of one percent as the S&P 500 fell by about one tenth of one percent. But the tech heavy Nasdaq had its first down day in five, dropping about seven tenths of one percent. Notable is the fact that the major averages were all higher early on. In fact, the Nasdaq carved out yet another all time record high. But those gains gave way to losses, in part as investors sold shares of Facebook once again. Shares of the social media company fell for a fourth day in a row, down about 1.7 percent on Thursday, as investors continued to digest data sharing with certain Chinese hardware companies. This weighed on the entire fang trade, with Amazon, Netflix and Alphabet dropping as well. Tech then was the worst sector for the S&P 500 and other notable names within the tech sector that dropped include social media companies Twitter, Snap and JD.com. The chips were weak too, down nearly 1% overall, led by Lamb Research, the semi-cap equipment company, on concerns about its memory pushouts. As for the best sector, that was energy, up 1.6% in sympathy with oil, but even so, Thursday had more of a risk-off flavor with tech selling off and Haven bonds rallying. In New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. And updates from the U.S. President Donald Trump has said that he may sign a pact to formally end the Korean War with Korean leader, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un at their meeting on the 12th of June and also raised the possibility of later hosting Kim at the White House. He, however, also said that he didn't have to prepare very much for the summit, saying that success at the meeting would be more about attitude. Listen in. We'll be discussing today trade, and obviously we will be talking at great length on North Korea. We'll be uh, getting some of your ideas. I'll be giving you some of our ideas. Uh, things are moving along well. It looks like the meeting is set. The summit is all uh, ready to go. Uh, subject always to change. You never know in this world. Subject to change. But the summit is all ready to go. Uh, North Korean representatives are in Singapore right now, working very hard, as are people from the United States. And uh, it's all going along very fine. I hope it continues on this track. If it does, the world will be a very happy place. I think I'm very well prepared. I don't think I have to prepare very much. It's about uh, attitude. It's about uh, willingness to get things done. But I think I've been preparing for the summit for a long time as has the other side. I think they've been preparing for a long time also. So this isn't a question of preparation. It's a question of whether or not people want it to happen. And we'll know that very quickly. I think it's not a one meeting deal. It would be wonderful if it were. You know, they've been doing this for a long time. There's been a lot of enemies out there, a lot of, a lot of dislike, a lot of hatred between the countries. And uh, this will not be uh, just a photo op. This will be, at a minimum, uh, we'll start with perhaps a good relationship, and that's something that's very important toward the ultimate making of a deal. I'd love to say it could happen in one deal. Maybe it can. They have to denuke. If they don't denuclearize, uh, that will not be acceptable. Uh, we cannot take sanctions off. The sanctions are extraordinarily powerful. We cannot, and I could add a lot more, but I don't, I've chosen not to do that at this time, uh, but that may happen. Uh, by the way, with Iran, we're uh, adding tremendously powerful sanctions. They understand that very well. I think Iran already is not the same country, if you look. I don't think they're looking so much to the Mediterranean like they were two months ago. 
So it's a big difference. It was number one nuclear, but also out of it, you also get the side benefit that Iran is a different place. And we'll see what happens, and maybe ultimately something will happen with Iran. But uh, for our meeting next week, I think it's going to be a very fruitful meeting. I think it's going to be an exciting meeting. I think we're going to get to know a lot of people that our country never got to know. This is something that should have been handled many years ago by other presidents. It shouldn't be handled now. It should have been handled years ago. But it is being handled now, and I'll take care of it. But before he heads to Singapore, he will have to travel to Canada to meet the rest of the group of seven leaders. The meetings on Friday and Saturday will be the first opportunity for America's closest allies to express their frustration in face-to-face -face meetings with Trump after he imposed steel and aluminium tariffs last week. President Emmanuel Macron of France has also warned that he will not sign the summit's traditional joint statement unless progress is made on tariffs and other contentious issues. Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli has all the updates. Well, the expectations are, from the European perspective, that they are not likely going to sign a joint statement with the United States unless there are some concessions made on the issue of tariffs and trade, as well as the president's decision to withdraw from two agreements, the Paris Climate Agreement, as well as the Iran nuclear disarmament deal. So that's a long shot in terms of the sources that I talk with connected to the administration. But the second issue, of course, uh, comes on the president dealing directly with NAFTA. And in the past several days, he has signaled through his senior economic advisors, most notably Larry Kudlow, that he's really considering ripping up this deal, throwing it out, and going a bilateral route with Mexico and with Canada. Now, we've also heard the rhetoric coming from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau with regards to how that would actually work. The president would have to give six months of a warning of sorts in order to do that and make that decision. And then he would also have to then renegotiate and fall back on a, a bilateral deal that's already in existence with Canada. So trade tensions have never Never been more tense, to put it mildly, heading into what uh, the French have said is a G7 plus one. All right. Uh, so most of the major Asian markets have opened up, of course, running into trade in India. But let's go straight to uh, Bloomberg's David Inglis, who is live from the Hong Kong studio for all the updates of the markets that have opened up so far. David, uh, how are we likely to end the week? I can see a lot of red uh, on my screen. Uh, likely to end the week down, but we're still up for the week. Uh, in fact, at these you know at these levels, we're still actually poised for the best week in in, in about four months. But that being said, of course, a bit of a downer uh, downer of a way here to, to to wrap things up here. There's the G7, which we talked about, of course, uh, taking place uh, later on tonight. Of course, Asia time, and uh, you look at some of these tweets coming out of President Trump. And I think the last one I read was uh, him, uh, I guess, in a lot of ways, castigating President Tr uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Have a look at that tweet just to give you an indication of uh, I guess the 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 attitudes and 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 the tone uh, leading up to that meeting so there's that and obviously overnight there's also uh, that bleed that we continue to see across several EM assets Brazil um, you have you have Turkey raising interest rates South Africa you had the Rand crossing uh, 13 for the first time since December of last year and in a lot of ways again both all because of the same thing and you look at central banks they're coming out and defending uh, their own currencies in different ways with the exception of south africa now uh, just very quickly so equities are down as you mentioned here we uh, give or take we're down about about half of one percent here uh, just an average across these markets the dollar is up so uh, bid here against asian fx uh, futures are also pointing lower as well and you're getting a move up in yields with the u.s two and ten also uh, sl moving slightly higher as we move into the weekend we're still waiting for chinese trade numbers which should come out in the next give or take about 90 minutes from now so this is something of course to look forward to and perhaps something positive hopefully that we can latch on to uh, because it's it's not exactly as we mentioned of course a, a, a good day uh, to be an equity investor right now if you're long of course thanks so much for that david and do have a great weekend let's uh, take a look at uh, india as well and see how we're likely to end the week right here Darshan Mehta and Agam Vakil are here to set you up for the day straight and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space. Darshan, easier to predict the markets than the weather.
Yeah, it is. Uh, it's down 50 points. That's what the SGX Nifty is indicating. But still, we have two hours to go. Uh, lots, can, lots can change uh, by that time. Uh, uh, overall, uh, you know, the global queues weren't the most encouraging. The SGX Nifty uh, is indicating a negative downtick. Yesterday, remember, it was the Bank Nifty expiry. So the so the moves that happened on the Nifty Bank were rather, you know, rather skewed. It moved up significantly and corrected significantly by the end of the day. Now, how did the ADR span out in trade? Most of them were down in trade. Vedanta was down over three. Infosys, HDFC Bank, and ICICI Bank seeing cuts that came in into themselves. What did well was Dr. Eddie's, which was up 1.5%. Wipro managed to move up. And Tata Motors, continuing from the good run of yesterday, has managed to move up much higher. The big talking point yesterday was crude. Crude was up over 2.5% in trade yesterday. The run continues on the WTI side. Brent is about the $77 barrel per mark. And WTI is about the $66 barrel per mark. Uh, as far as base metals were concerned, it was a mixed closing by base metals on the LME. If you're looking at what happened, copper was up 1.5% and tin was up over 1.5%. But apart from it, it was rather muted. Aluminium fell in over 1.5% and uh, nickel fell in over 7 tenths of a percent. Uh, base metals in China currently not the best start. Uh, all of them are trading with a negative bias, especially steel, which is down over 1% in trade. And precious metals are absolutely flat in trade currently. Uh, what happened with the fund flows? Uh, FIS continued to net sell. They sold in almost 525 crores in the cash market. DIS bought in almost 1,200 crores in the cash market. Overall, uh, the Nifty managed to move up much higher yesterday. It was up another 83 points. The mid cap and small cap, the rally continues on those two sectors. Now, if you're looking at uh, the sectors that were in focus, real estate did well and metal did well. So these are the beaten down sectors over the past few days, and they have managed to rebound significantly in trade. So that's what's happening currently. Now, India Wix moved up over 2% uh, since the market was rather volatile, and it was the Nifty Bank expiry. Overall, the Nifty was up 83 points. What contributed? Reliance, ICICI Bank and Infosys were the main contributors. A lot of private sector banks seeing a little bit of selling off that happened. But Agam, what are you spotting? Well, Darshan, we again saw the Nifty move back above the mark of 10,800 on an intraday basis. And, uh, well, there was a lot of strength coming in, building on the kind of gains that we saw on the day of the RBI policy. So, as you can see, this accumulation now when it comes to open interest towards the Nifty futures in the longs. Let's take a look at the Nifty Bank futures, and it's the same. Well, the Nifty Bank did not advance as much as the benchmarks. Well, we did see advances all the same. And in terms of the Wix, again, you know, this is largely hanging around 12 and a half and 13 over the bar. And that, that's exactly what we see, not too much change in the Wix either. But the put call ratio has now edged higher to around 1.5. So watch out for that. There are a lot more puts being written uh, in, in terms of the way things are being panning out. And again, a repeat, a repeat of what we see uh, in the previous few sessions. Well, more writing in the 10,700 and the 10,800 mark. So that could provide us the near-term support going in. Do remember, we're just 27 points away from 10,007 on the downside. So uh, that said, there are no changes in open interest for uh, when it comes to some of these stock futures. This, of course, is your maximum open interest. It continues to remain between 10,600 and 11,000. So that's the broad range that we are getting in on. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know some uh, stocks, uh, we're, we're keeping an eye on United Breweries. As you can see, 16% added in open interest longs there. We're also seeing longs in something like an Indian bank. That moved up as much as 1.5%. And, percent. and uh, in terms of change, Changes in open interest on the downside, we've seen Walter see fresh shorts building in. So a lot of stocks to keep an eye on. And we'll be watching out for Nifty, which is showing a decline of as much as half a percent. All right, thanks so much for that, Agam. Let's quickly take, uh, take a check on the rupee in the bond market. Now, reversing Wednesday's gains, the rupee yesterday fell by 20 pesi to 67.12 against the US dollar as a revival in global crude prices renewed India's concerns on the fiscal front. Now, besides concerns of higher US yields and foreign fund outflows from stock markets and bond markets also added pressure on the rupee. The yield on the 10-year government bonds on Thursday closed at near 8%, the first time since December 2014, a day after the Reserve Bank of India raised the key interest rates and changed the liquidity coverage norms. All right, Interim Finance Minister Piyush Goyal will meet the heads of a top 
public sector banks today from the western and southern regions to discuss a framework for the consolidation of PSU banks. Nikun Jori gets us a heads up on this report. Finance Minister Piyush Goyal is going to meet heads of public sector banks today and one of the uh, agenda items for discussion is going to be the roadmap for consolidation of public sector banks. There are a lot of reports, there are a lot of media reports which suggest that stronger banks would be the likely acquirers of small public sector banks, small or weak public sector banks. But as far as the government is concerned, there's no official word as of now and the government has maintained its stance that it is on track when, it's com when it comes to consolidation of public sector banks. But any any official announcement will only be made once uh, the um, once the candidates for merger are identified and the nitty gritties of uh, the de of the merger is finalized all right let's uh, shift focus to commodities and specifically uh, i think on crude because there's a lot of uh, movement there to talk about jesh kilani is here with all the updates morning jesh that's right, Alex. In fact, uh, uh, oil prices have seen some bit of uh, uptick come about uh, in the overnight session. So Brent was up about 2.5% and uh, WTI was also up about 1.9%. Uh, uh, now, this is on the back of uh, uh, the clues that investors are watching out for, which will come out uh, from the OPEC meeting uh, this month. And also that, uh, uh, you know, if there is a sign of any output increase. Uh, traders are, in fact, also watching out for uh, the Russia-Saudi, uh, you know, soccer uh, match that is going to be played in the World Cup uh, and in fact uh, watching out for queues if anything any announcement is made on that front. Um, also we understand that Venezuela has not written to OPEC members uh, to you know unite against uh, the US sanctions. Uh, so these are some of the updates for in the oil markets. As far as uh, uh, base metals are concerned we had a mixed close for individual base metals uh, but copper did help uh, the index to close uh, you know higher for the eighth consecutive session. Uh, copper prices uh, surged about 1.5% and hit a four-year high on the back of uh, supply risk and also uh, copper was up for the sixth trade day uh, which was the longest rally since December last year. Uh, as far as other base metals are concerned we had tin which was up about 1.7% which was the top gainer in trade and the top loser was aluminium which declined as much as 1.4%. Uh, zinc and nickel also ended marginally lower. Now, if you look at the precious metal space, uh, we are seeing some renewed uh, uptick come about for silver prices. Uh, so, silver posted its highest close since April on the back of uh, demand uh, supply. And we had uh, gold, which also inched higher to the tune of about one-tenth of a percent. All right. Thanks so much for that, Chesh. On to the stocks in news. What are the stocks that you have to watch out for and trade today? Well, Nikki Machinani is here to tell you all about that. Morning, Nikki. What do you have for us? Hi Alex, so to begin with we're going to start off with IIFL where uh, the IIFL sponsored read has gotten a certificate of registration from SEBI to conduct the activity as an real estate investment trust. Also we are tracking OMAX Auto where uh, the company board of directors have given a nod to double the capacity of the company with an investment of around 100 and 120 odd crore in the span of next two to three odd, uh, two to three odd years. IDFC2 is expected to be in focus on back of the development that UK CDC group is expected to invest in IDFC alternative PE uh, division. This is a mint exclusive that we're tracking this morning. Also making to our list is HDFC which is in talks to raise $750 million through ECB. Now this is an ET exclusive. Uh, in terms of Baldies, we have a couple of them. Uh, to begin with we have uh, Ashiana Housing where Goldman Sachs has uh, sold, uh, sorry, has sold in 2.8% stake in the company. Company for a for a sum of around 43 odd crore. Indoco Remedies also DSP BlackRock has actually bought, uh, sold in 1.6 percent stake in the counter for a sum of around 29 odd crore. And last in the list we have uh, Sharda Crop Chem, where Goldman Sachs has sold in 1.5 percent stake in the company for a sum of around 55 odd crore. All right, thanks so much for that, Nikki. Uh, and Swamit Sarkar is standing by with, with the big brokerage calls of the day. Swamit, what do you have for us today? Good morning, Alex. On the big brokerage calls for the day, first we have is Venture Securities on Bike Hospitality. Now, the brokerage has initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of 351 rupees, which suggests a potential upside of 106% over the next 24 to 30 months for the company. Now, the brokerage is expecting the industry, hotel industry, to report much better performance than what it did in the last 10 years. And Bike is well positioned to benefit from this uptrend in the hotel industry, according to the brokerage. 
valuation of the company's asset light business model, strategic location of its properties and adequate new capacities in the mid-scale segment are the positives that will be benefiting the company going forward. Now the company's asset light business model are expected to keep the return ratios at an elevated level for bike hospitality according to the brokers. Now the company has the, the brokerage is expecting an upturn in the hotel industry and the brokerage is expecting the company's revenue to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 22% over FY18 to FY21. And despite this aggressive room expansion plans that the company has, the brokerage is expecting the occupancy rate of bike hospitality to increase to 71% by FY21 from 65% in financial year 2017. And this rise in occupancy rate will lead to better operating leverage and higher margin for the company going forward according to the brokerage. Second we have is JP Morgan on Asian Peen's annual report highlights. Now, the brokerage has maintained its neutral rating on the stock with a target price of around 1300 rupees. The company's revenue growth outlook for FY19 is positive, led by healthy domestic demand, which will aid, which will be aided by rural recovery and better performance expected from the overseas operations of Asian Peen's. And the major growth drivers for the company include expanded distribution reach, scale up of new retail formats, product innovation, and contribution from the new segments like waterproofing, home improvement etc on the challenges side the company is saying that the rising raw material prices is the only key challenge for the company in financial year 2019 and lastly it is said that in fy18 the free cash flow and return ratios of the company moderated owing to the higher capital expenditure plans that the company had in the last year all right thanks so much for that Tommy. now here's something that you probably haven't heard for a little while former president of india pranam mukherjee was speaking yesterday and he was speaking at an rss event he stressed on the need to preserve and celebrate India's diversity. Now, he also uh, spoke about the fact that factors like intolerance dilute India's diversity and nationalism. Listen in. I believe informed and reasoned public engagement on all issues of national importance is essential. A dialogue is necessary not only to balance the competing interests, but also to reconcile them. Divergent strands in public discourse have to be recognized. We may argue, we may agree, we may not agree, but we cannot deny the essential prevalence of multiplicity of opinion. Only through a dialogue can we develop the understanding to solve the complex problems without an unhealthy strife within our polity? The soul of India resides in pluralism and tolerance. This plurality of our society has come through assimilation of ideas over centuries. Secularism and inclusions are a matter of faith for us. It is our composite culture which makes us into a nation. India's nationhood is not one language, one religion, one entity. When I shut my eyes and dream of India, from Mijoram to Dwarka, from snow-capped Himalayan to way west, was Cape Comodin. I mesmerize how it is possible 1.3 billion people use more than 122 languages and 1,600 dialects in their everyday life. All right, that's uh, former President of India, Pranam Mukherjee, speaking there at an RSS event. Now, clearly, there's lots to talk about over the course of the day, and you'll find all the live market action right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. There are also several stories that you can consider reading on the website, BloombergQuint.com, and here are just a few of them. The Indian government has sought an explanation from Facebook by the 20th of June on reports that suggested that it had shared information of users with mobile device makers. And now in an official statement, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has asked for a detailed factual report from the company saying it was deeply concerned. 
And it turns out that the government will also continue to pursue disinvestment of debt lead in Air India. The revised bidding norms are likely to be finalised soon. Moving on. The BJP has kick-started its campaign for the 2019 Lok Sabha poll with its outreach program Sampark for Samarthan. What's the campaign about and what does the BJP hope to achieve through it? Here's a special report. I'm sure a lot of you are queuing up for the World Cup. Back home though, the Indian football team was still buzzing after its 3-0 win against Kenya early in the week. But its defence got split wide open by New Zealand's wingers in yesterday's match. It ended 2-1. India scored first with captain Chetri capitalising on a mistake by the keeper. But the lead didn't last long with New Zealand equalising in the next minute itself. And just as the game seemed to be heading for a tie, New Zealand's Moses Dyer secured another goal in the 85th minute. Nothing to worry about though, India has made it to the finals and what's more, it may get to face New Zealand again unless Kenya beats the Chinese Taipei in the big, by a big margin in today's match. Alright, that's all we have for you. Do stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint and what's more, do stay safe in Mumbai this weekend if you are here. Projections for heavy rainfall. Take care.